of the Deadly Experiment. Your host, Rick Adams, here with you. We're on the phones by connection here because we are on the road, on the move. Folks, things are happening very quickly in the world now. We are definitely in the home stretch of the end of this age, the Earth Age number two that the Bible describes, friends. Today I'm going to bring you a special program, though, a special couple of programs put together from the 1960s when Lyndon Johnson was president following the, uh, the assassination of JFK. And uh, the speaker that you're going to see is no stranger to these airwaves. Dan Smoot, constitutional scholar, a literary scholar, and a television program uh, narrator who was an educational instrument in the time of the 1960s. He then was trying to show America that she only had a limited time to make it in the world if she didn't change course. Nobody listened but a handful, and unfortunately, his prognostications, his predictions, and his analyses were right on the money. I want you today to get a smattering of his educational ministries on the Constitution of the United States, America's promise, and the difference between two opposites, a republic and a democracy. A republic is the rule of law. Uh, to ensure the freedom and individuality of the rights of the people. A democracy is a tyranny. It always results in mob rule. In the very end, where we are today, where we have become an empire, America is rapidly descending, and no presidential candidate, nobody on the horizon, despite the rhetoric to the contrary is in a position to turn it around because my friends if your foundation of your home is eaten away by termites calling in a root specialist is not going to solve the problem now is it the bible tells us this you see the word of god tells us set your spiritual priorities in order and second peter chapter three we read about Peter's vision of the end of this age and the end of this earth in fire and brimstone. So he tells us that if we're not prepared uh, to understand uh, that this earth age is going to come to an end, America is going to experience her final gasp of breath in the very near future. As goes America, goes the world. Don't think it's not happening behind the scenes right now. The economy the educational system, the political, and most of all, the religious are all part of the four winds that are recorded in the book of Zechariah. And this uh, papal visit that we've had, of course, is indicative of the push, the mad push toward a one world government. The Pope himself made it very clear, being a Jesuit, which is a Marxist socialist order in the Catholic Church, that he, of course, is nothing more than a proponent of ecumenism, of universalism, of bringing the world together. Now, the Bible and Jesus Christ, our Lord, says just the opposite, that we need to separate ourselves from the world, that we need to uh, divide ourselves, because when he comes, he says he's coming not to bring together, but to divide. I come with the sword to divide asunder. Now, that's an exact opposite of what the Pope said in America this past year, you see. Folks, we need to understand Religion is one of the means to an end of creating a one-world system, along with the United Nations, along with UNESCO, the Council on Foreign Relations, and all of these institutions. Dan Smoot was a pioneer in broadcasting in the 60s. He is an absolute genius compared to what we have today, teaching our students in schools, colleges, and particularly law schools, where very little law is taught today. Judicial equity is taught as opposed to law. So right now, with this introduction, we are going to go right into the first and second programs of the Dan Smoot Report having to do with America's promise lost and a constitutional republic, not a democracy. Let us begin right now. America's promise. 
To President Johnson, a great society means government-guaranteed material prosperity and universal equality as defined and enforced by government. To the American Founding Fathers, a great society meant a political system which left people free to follow their own destinies with God's help. Not a nation devoted to the ideal of the common man, but a place where a man could become uncommon without a government to harass him and hold him down to a common level. America was founded and built into the greatest nation of all times by men who established a constitutional system of limited government to guarantee personal freedom by men who, firm in their faith in God, spoke with divine authority when they said to their own government, Thou shalt not abridge these freedoms which God has given us. Government shall not. That was the promise of America. That is a summary of my report on America's promise. The full report after a message from my sponsor. To President Lyndon B. Johnson, a great society means government-provided housing, government-guaranteed medical care, government-financed education, government-stabilized agriculture, government-subsidized arts, government-controlled industry, government-regulated jobs, government-created material prosperity, and universal equality as defined and enforced by government. To the American Founding Fathers, a great society meant the direct opposite. It meant a political system which left people free to follow their own destinies with God's help. The promise of America is obvious to anyone who knows her early history, knows enough about the Founding Fathers to understand their lives and their ideals. But the teeming millions from Europe who glutted our eastern ports of entry and pushed across the continent to the Pacific in the 19th century, they, for the most part, were ignorant of the details of American history. What was the promise of America to them? A promise of fertile land, cheap and abundant? A promise of great deposits of natural resources? A promise of good climate? There have always been other places with greater natural resources, with climate as good or better, and with land more fertile and plentiful than in the United States of America. Those American pioneers who pushed through gaps in the mountains, driving westward with blue vistas of hope and adventure in their eyes, were they in quest of social security or some kind of government guaranteed existence? Were they yearning for the fat and easy life? Were they bound for the land of the common man? Most of them were common men in the general evaluation of the world. Most of them were poor and would have welcomed abundance. They all were human and would have been glad to be spared hardship and arduous labor. But these were not the things they sought in the new world. They expected and they encountered more hardship and harsh toil in the raw American wilderness than they had left behind in Europe. They were looking for a place where a common man could, God willing, become uncommon, where a man could become whatever his vision, his faith, his energy, his intellect, and his manhood combined to make him, without a government to harass him and hold him down to a common level for the benefit of the general welfare. In short, the promise of America was freedom. Today, a whole generation of Americans have been educated to believe that freedom means ease and comfort. Freedom is not a soft way of life, but it is the only noble way for creatures made in the image of God. When man is left free to struggle, he develops strength and wisdom by struggling. When forced into dependence upon government, he becomes a dependent personality, flabby and irresolute, with no will, courage, or personal convictions. A free man can dream and will dare to enter what Job called the warfare of life, to capture his dreams and transform them into reality. A dependent personality has no dream of conquering anything. He has instead greed. Greed to get all he can for himself, not by constructive effort, but by continuing demands upon the power which made him dependent. There are many hazards in a free society, one hazard is that there will always be people who will not manage their own affairs as well as they should, or as well as someone else thinks they should. But when you start passing laws to force people to do all the things that someone else thinks good for them, you are headed for a slave society. The early American patriots had a deep suspicion of all government, including the one they created. They knew that the worst threat to a man's life, liberty, and property is the government under which he lives. They knew that all governments will, if permitted, waste the labors of the people and ultimately enslave the people, always under the pretense of taking care of the people. 
Modern liberals are not suspicious of government. They worship government. They want to set government up as a kind of big brother deity to look after us and run our lives for us. Modern liberals presume that you, an individual, if left to your own devices and resources, do not have enough decency, ability, or good sense to educate your own children, provide your own housing, prepare for your own future, or help a neighbor in desperate need. Therefore, liberals want laws which will force you to do all things that liberals think you should do. They take money away from you and put it in a big federal pot on the presumption that politicians and bureaucrats will make better use of your money than you would. But remember, politicians and bureaucrats are themselves individuals. As individuals, they, according to their own liberal philosophy, are incapable of managing their own affairs. Once vested with political power, they are presumably transfigured and transformed, automatically injected with enough ability to manage the affairs of the world. In short, modern, liberal, modern liberalism rests on the assumption that political power makes men wiser than God. As philosophies of government, modern liberalism, communism, and fascism are all essentially the same. Each believes that government should have absolute power to promote the general welfare. The trouble here is that when government has absolute power to promote the general welfare, government must have absolute power to decide what the general welfare is. Why do communists murder people in nations they take over? Well, they're promoting the general welfare as communists see it. The welfare state with the usual trappings of government price controls, government fixed minimum wages, government subsidies, government relief for the poor, and government pensions, it was tried out in ancient Babylon, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, in Mussolini's Italy, in Hitler's Germany, and in all communist countries. It has always failed to provide economic security and has always ended in tyranny. A government which can take a warm personal interest in one citizen can take a cold, calculating interest in another. A government which can subsidize your farm or business or send you checks for unemployment or relief can also seize the bodies and property of your sons and daughters. Many Americans are pitifully confused in their efforts to defend Americanism against communism because they do not really know the difference. They have the leadership of modern liberalism to thank for this confusion. Using the police power of government to take from those who have for redistribution among those who have not is called by our liberals achieving economic justice through the processes of democracy. In communist countries, the same thing is called liquidation of capitalism through the dictatorship of the proletariat. What is the Americanism concept of helping the have-nots? Every American has an individual responsibility under God to help others in distress. But the decision as to when, how much, and to whom is legally and morally his and not his government's. Government cannot make men prosperous any more than it can make men good. Government cannot produce anything. It can merely seize and divide what individuals have produced. Government can give the people nothing which government has not first taken away from them. And the amount which government doles back to the people or spends to promote their welfare is always less than it takes. America is a fabulous country, a land where lofty mountains and deep rivers bear names that are music on the tongue, names rich in the lore and legend of marvelous and mysterious Indian tribes who prefer death to surrender. But America is more than poetry. It is a land where men know that morality, conscience, and happiness can be achieved only by individual effort with divine help where equality signifies the equal importance of individuals before God and before the law, but recognizes the infinite diversity of talents, tastes, ambitions, capacities, and material conditions as natural for free man and essential to the progress of human society. Where stern men, firm in their faith in God, speak with divine authority when they say to their own government, Thou shalt not abridge these freedoms which God has given us. I cringe when I hear an American praise the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and insinuate that it is an extension of the American Bill of Rights. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is a blueprint for international socialism. 
It is a promise of all member nations that the force of government will be used to level and spread material benefits until everyone enjoys the same kind of sameness that characterizes a fine litter of fattening hogs. The American Bill of Rights, on the contrary, tells government what it must not do. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects shall not be violated. Government shall not. That is the American philosophy of liberty which spread abroad and tugged at the hearts of men all over the earth. That was the promise of America. This is the 10th anniversary broadcast of the Dance Moot Report. It is a revision of the first broadcast I made in this series 10 years ago. On this 10th anniversary of my broadcast, I have given you a brief of America's promise, my original broadcast, because I cherish a great truth expressed by George Mason, Mason, one of our founding fathers. George Mason said, no free government or the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. That is why through the years I recur to the fundamental principles that form the bedrock of our society. Constitution of the United States we cannot re-establish constitutional government and restore our free republic until a decisive number of Americans understand the Constitution and use it as a guide to political action. A Constitution is meaningless unless it is construed to mean exactly what it says and unless agents of government are compelled to obey all its provisions. You cannot depend on politicians to tell you whether they violate the Constitution. They all say they respect and obey it. You cannot depend on any agent of government to tell you what your constitution means. You must read it yourself to find out. When you find out, you should do your utmost to remove from public office every official who violates the constitution's clear meaning, if you want to save your own freedom and help restore your republic. I have published the full text of the constitution. All who order copies of this broadcast will receive it. That is a summary of my report on Constitution of the United States the full report after a message from my sponsor. The Constitution delegates the major powers of the federal government to Congress. The Constitution provides for a Supreme Court specifying and limiting its original jurisdiction, giving Congress absolute authority to control, limit or abolish the court's appellate jurisdiction. Federal courts are given no authority over any state laws. The first article of the Constitution begins all legislative powers herein granted. This means that the federal government cannot legally exercise any power not clearly granted in the Constitution. The 52-word preamble includes promotion of the general welfare among the broad purposes for which the Constitution was ordained, but the preamble is not a grant of power. The only other place where promotion of the general welfare is mentioned in our Constitution is Section 8 of Article 1. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imports, and excises, to pay the debts and pr provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Many assert that this general welfare clause gives government broad powers to do anything which the President and Congress claim to be necessary for common defense and general welfare. That is not true. James Madison, father of the Constitution, said the Constitution grants no general powers to the federal government. He explained that the so-called welfare clause is not a grant of power, it is merely a heading for enumerated powers which Congress may exercise to provide for the common defense and general welfare. James Madison delivered a speech on this subject to the first United States Congress, quote, if Congress can apply money indefinitely to the general welfare and are the sole and supreme judges of the general welfare, they may take the care of religion into their own hands. They may establish teachers in every state, county and parish, and may pay them out of the public treasury. They may take into their own hands the education of children, establishing in like manner schools throughout the Union. They may undertake the regulation of all roads other than post roads. In short, everything from the highest object of state legislation down to the most minute object of policy would be thrown under the power of Congress, 
for every object I have mentioned would admit the application of money and might be called, if Congress pleased, provisions for the general welfare. End quote. Madison also said, the powers delegated to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The powers reserved to the states will extend to all the objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. In short, the Constitution created a system in which the federal government is limited to enumerated powers, states remaining sovereign republics with regard to their internal affairs. In such a system, state governments, which can be controlled by local citizens, have elastic, unspecified power to experiment with social reform legislation which may seem to be required. Legislation, for example, dealing with unemployment, medical care for the destitute, and other such general welfare programs. If a state government abuses its broad powers, it will lose productive citizens to other states. The experience of other states and competition among states will force correction of major errors. If the federal government is given broad general powers to experiment with social reform legislation and to intervene in private and state affairs, the stupidities of the general bureaucracy can be imposed on the whole population uniformly, leaving no place for oppressed citizens to seek refuge, no competition to force correction or even admission of error, no competitive example anywhere to prove that freedom works better than bureaucratic planning. If federal officials assume power to experiment with programs not authorized by the Constitution, they break the contract of government, the Constitution. When, for any cause however popular, for any need however great, for any emergency however dire, federal officials violate the binding contract of the Constitution, nothing is left to fend off tyranny. When the federal government commits one act not authorized by the Constitution, it cracks the dam erected to control governmental power. The crack may at first be imperceptible, but eventually it will widen until the dam is gone, and a destructive flood of uncontrollable governmental power will engulf all. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, expressed the unique American concept of a constitutionally limited federal government when he said, in questions of political power, speak to me not of confidence in men, but just bind them down from mischief with the chains of a constitution. Does this mean that an 18th century constitution prevents the nation from ever acting through the federal government to do something which a majority wants done? No, the people, by due process, can amend the Constitution, granting power which they want government to have. By no other means can the Constitution be legally changed, or limitations of the power of government legally altered. A Supreme Court decision is not constitutionally valid if it reads into the Constitution or its amendments some meaning not there when the Constitution and its amendments were adopted. Presidential decrees and acts of Congress are constitutionally invalid no matter what the Supreme Court says and no matter how many previous decrees and acts may be cited as precedents if said decrees and acts are not patently constitutionally authorized. Obeying the Constitution does not mean obedience by the people. It means obedience by the federal government. The Constitution is a binding contract adopted by the people meaning exactly what it says to be obeyed meticulously by all agents and agencies of government, to be changed only by explicit constitutional process. Legislative, executive, and judicial usurpation of power has violated the Constitution so long and so outrageously that this nation is sinking day by day into a morass of lawless tyranny. We cannot reestablish constitutional government and restore our free republic until a decisive number of Americans understand our organic documents of government and use them as guides to political action. The organic documents are the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as amended. In the report on which this broadcast is based and in the report for the broadcast next week, I publish full text of our organic documents of government. 
The Declaration of Independence is too short to fill one whole report. The Constitution and its 24 amendments are too long for one report. So in the report on which this particular broadcast is based, I published the full text of the Constitution of the United States as written by the Founding Fathers at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, 1787, and as adopted by the original 13 states in the American Union. The actual text is prefaced with brief commentary on the meaning of the Constitution, the commentary taken largely from the Founding Fathers themselves. My broadcast next week will give full text of the Declaration of Independence and of all constitutional amendments with commentary. My hope is that a significant number of Americans will get, read, pass on to others, and discuss these documents, which are the foundation stones of our greatness as a nation, the only bulwarks to protect our liberties as civilized human beings. Unless a significant number of Americans do study these organic documents of government, and use them as guides to political action, our republic is doomed. A constitution is meaningless unless it is construed to mean exactly what it says and unless the agents of government sworn to uphold the constitution are compelled to obey all its provisions explicitly. You should not vote for any politician who consistently, by his voting in Congress and by his support of federal programs and policies, violates the constitution. You cannot depend on the politicians to tell you whether they violate the Constitution. They all tell you they respect and obey it. You cannot depend on any agents of government in the judicial, executive, or legislative branches to tell you what your Constitution means. You must read it yourself to find out. When you find out, you should do your utmost to remove from public office every official who violates the Constitution's clear meaning if you want to save your own freedom and help restore your republic. All who order copies of this broadcast will receive the full text of the Constitution of the United States with commentary from the Founding Fathers. I am Dan Smoot. Goodbye. God bless you. Well, so folks, you've heard it from a, a master of knowledge and wisdom. Professor Smoot had it right then in the 1960s when many of us were growing up watching Andy Griffith and watching Petticoat Junction and programs that, uh, though they were pretty wholesome by today's standards, certainly kept us all asleep, kept us all having fun uh, at a time when all of this insidious uh, destruction of American freedom was taking place. Um, certainly in the courts, in the Congress, and in the White House. You know, we, we've seen what's happened to a young lady, Kimberly Davis, who decided she was going to stand by her conscience, by her soul, as Roger Williams did, in the state of Kentucky, in refusing to acknowledge or in any way accept licenses for sodomite marriages. Now, she was protected under state law. But a judge who had no authority to do so, as Smoot implied, you see, violating the strictures of the Constitution, was allowed to put this woman, Kimberly Davis, in prison for contempt of court. The judge should be dealt with severely. The old days, we'd have a firing squad for judges that violated the Constitution like that. Article 3, Section 2, Clause 2 makes it clear that all appellate jurisdiction on all issues is regulated and made with exceptions as Congress shall see fit. Congress can abolish the court's hearing of these cases, the so-called gay marriage decision of the Supreme Court. But do you think Mitch McConnell would do it? Never happened. Not even Huxtabee. Friends, that's the message of Dan Smoot. We have no constitutional Congress, otherwise it would reign in the courts. We're out of time. Thank you all. Rick Adams, goodbye, and Yahweh bless his elect. <laughs>